Welcome to Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Kevin Clarkson. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm going to continue tonight with some look in the scriptures in Daniel related to the nature of government, the tyranny of government, and the direction it will be headed in the final days. I began a series, oh, I think last September, October, and we shared several studies with you as I looked at specific nations that are predicted to arise in the book of Daniel. Those were a roadmap for the Jewish nation, but they also serve to prove the authenticity of God's word, his sheer predictive power, his control of history. All of these things are mighty, mighty demonstrations of the truth of Scripture and the power of God. Another thing that we find here is a specific and precise prediction about the coming of Christ. And what I was doing last fall as we looked at these, we were in the midst of an election season and I was marching us through and there have been several world empires besides the ones Daniel saw, but the ones Daniel saw in his vision and Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream have to do primarily with those empires of the world that have touched the nation of Israel. And so we trace those and we actually from Daniel 10 begin to see that there's spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes. And I would again suggest to you that wherever there is a power center in the world, which is a government central focus, uh, there is a lot of demonic activity. And unless there be strong prayers of the saints of the righteous to beat back the hosts of hell, uh, there's going to be a, a, a stronghold, a satanic dominion established there. That's why these empires are mentioned. And just to summarize, because it has been some weeks, I stopped short of the last one. I wanted to see what the election would hold. And as we stand now, as this is uh, being taped within just uh, several days of the inauguration of Donald Trump. Uh, perhaps we see uh, a reprieve. Perhaps we see an opportunity for a renewal and a call to revival. Uh, not to say that any human elected official is any kind of savior. They're simply God's instruments. But to say that perhaps God has shown a little mercy and we're not rolling irrevocably down a road yet. Although I can't say for certain and we'll keep looking to the scripture and to the Lord that final direction let me summarize though uh, Daniel 2 Nebuchadnezzar is given a dream and in that dream he sees a glittering statue and that's man's view of government it's awesome it's impressive it's glittering it's it's gloried and 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 in the next chapter 3 Nebuchadnezzar some years later actually builds a impressive statue uh, that is 60 cubits high and six cubits wide and they're the number six six but he commands everyone to worship it and it's probably an image of himself in Daniel 2, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, <coughs> the empires are shown in their successive order as they pertained to the nation of Israel. And those were Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. In Daniel chapter 7, some years later, the prophet himself is given a dream. And there represented are the very same four empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And yet we saw that God revealed to Daniel the prophet the true nature of government. It's really not a glittering statue to be adored, idolized, and worshipped. It's a series of ravenous beasts that are bent on destroying and devouring. And what a frightening truth that is. It even comes out in the, in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar because the final empire, which was Rome, has feet of uh, clay and uh, feet of iron that crush and trample everything beneath them. And so where a man admires and builds monuments and talks about the efficiency of his government, God says it's actually a beast that cannot be tamed. And we looked at some of the dangers of that and the very nature. And if we don't recognize the Lord God and Jesus Christ, which both of those, uh, the vision and the dream, end with the Son of Man, Jesus, coming to eclipse all those human governments. That's the main point of all of this. God's kingdom is going to be the final kingdom and Jesus will be the king. Praise the Lord for that. But if we don't recognize and enthrone him, we're headed for tyranny. And God is going to let this world go to a real place in the end time where man is given what he wants. Uh, he's going to have a very secularized, almost anti-dismissive uh, of God world where man's going to create his own type of religion and worship himself. And these empires actually show that. What we did in the fall was we went back beyond the four that are mentioned in Daniel 2 and 7. And we looked at two other empires that had to do with Israel. And they were Egypt and Assyria. Because those were before the time of Daniel. 
And just to, to, to remind you of why we looked at them, we looked at the spirit behind them. Uh, there are uh, principalities and powers spoken of in the scripture, and these principalities are hierarchical spirits that are very high uh, in the commanding uh, organization of Satan, and it's believed that they are over certain territories and over certain kingdoms. So we saw as we went through those, and I won't do anything but just kind of pre- review today, we saw that those same spirits are with us still and very much a lot of the spiritual warfare that goes on. Egypt, of course, represented bondage. And we went to the book of Exodus for that. And <clears throat> you could go to some other places. But Egypt is a spirit of bondage. And we see that even today in America. We see chemical addictions, drug addictions. We see financial addictions. We see pornography and immorality. People are ensnared and ensconed in their sin, unable to extricate themselves and really just being absolutely thrust under. They are promised liberty, as Satan always does, but they're given bondage at the end result. Then we saw the kingdom of Assyria, and we noted for you that that actual uh, uh, spirit behind the Assyria was a spirit of division. Uh, and that was very true because Israel in the days of Assyrian Empire was divided into Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And we see that same spirit of division at play in our country very much we're just ending uh, really uh, some of the most tumultuous years we've had in my memory of racial strife and tension Uh, the black lives matter movement uh, although it may have in some aspects uh, some noble goals has actually been i believe used for very divisive things uh, used to further strife used to further violence and crime and even as i am taping this uh, Within the headlines this week, as we talk about prophecy in the news, uh, there was a uh, young uh, mentally handicapped man, a teenager in Chicago, who was brutalized, kidnapped, and held for 48 hours and tortured and brutalized by uh, four African-American teenagers in Chicago. And they they forced this young man, while he was under their power, to uh, just curse the incoming president and curse white people and... Uh, the astonishing thing wasn't that that happened with the climate we've had. It was that as the Chicago police brought in an initial report and as the press reacted, they were still unsure whether this was really a hate crime or not. Now, come on, folks. Uh, if we simply reverse the colors of the perpetrators versus the victim, uh, if that had been four white uh, people doing that to a mentally handicapped black teenager, cities would be burning in America right now. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out to people that don't know the Lord because uh, they're they're settling for so much hatred in their lives and hearts. Uh, You have to walk with the Lord to overcome these things. And we love all men. And when we come to the Bible, truly, we're all from one set of parents. We're from Adam and Eve. And uh, chromosomally, scientists have admitted within the last several years that all human races trace back to... uh, you know two people genetically well duh the bible said that in genesis chapter one so we've come around to god's word again and that's a good thing but the spirit of division is very much with us and it's not only about races it's about classes and i'd suggest to you that uh really beyond the color of people's skin uh even the quote black lives matter what's really behind a lot of the movements today is more of a class warfare Uh, where uh, a few people who are, I believe, globalists and socialists, who I'll talk about more in a moment, uh, are are trying to orchestrate uh, the evaporation of the middle class and to really subjugate everyone into a sub-poverty level uh, globally. So then we came to Babylon, and we saw the spirit of Babylon. Again, I'm just reviewing. The spirit of Babylon was all about rebellion and confusion, and those two things always go together. Uh, Babylon founded by Nimrod his name means we will rebel and uh, God sent confusion in the wake of that and wherever you have rebellion you end up with confusion because God is a God of order and authority and so when Satan began to rebel he created confusion God is not the author of confusion the New Testament says and so we understand that the origin of this is satanic and we certainly see much rebellion again in our society today as we see violence, as we see riots in the streets, as we see all of the unrest in Europe and all the, the dangers of the, of the immigration attacks and violence, and we see the Middle East coming apart. We're seeing more uh, out expression outward of rebellion, I think, in these last five years uh, globally than, 
than we've seen in many, many years up until this time. So the spirit of, uh, of Babylon is very much with us. And then we talked about the spirit of Persia. And that is really a spirit of, of just trying to enlarge, uh, trying to uh, increase at the expense of the suffering of others. And that's a spirit of conquest and greed. And, and certainly that satanic spirit is with us. God is all about growth. God is all about enlargement in a way that honors him. But when it's done for just self-aggrandizing, uh, it's satanic. Then we came and we ended really our study last on this area with Greece. And with Greece, we had the high, high stage of humanism, the emergence of philosophy, the lifting of the arts, the, uh, the worship of the human body. As you have the Olympic Games and the statues and arts of uh, naked figures uh, throughout the temples and the, uh, the uh, architecture of Greece. Uh, those things in and of themselves can be very good. Art's a beautiful thing. Philosophy, uh, the Bible says, avoid vain speculation and philosophies that can lead you astray. But the word philosophy, when you break it down, means to love wisdom. And certainly we're told in the Bible to pursue and love wisdom. So pure righteous philosophy is not a bad thing. It's when we take God out of it that it becomes evil. And that's what happened in Greece. Spirit's very much with us. We call it today humanism. And that's the idea that man is the measure of all things. Man is the ultimate end. You know, today uh, we can't say certain words that are pejorative racially. You can't say certain words that carry a, a sexist overtone without getting people all rankled and, and up in arms. And rightfully so. I, w- I would agree with that. But let me say to you, a hundred years ago or more, or even 50 years ago or more, there was the very same reaction when you took God's name in vain. In fact, there ought to be a stiffer reaction to degrading the name of God than there is to man. But because modern man, today's world, doesn't have a place for God, it's perfectly fine with dissing him, dishonoring him, dragging his name through the mud. And as we'd observe with you, as we can all see, and when we think about it, it's very clear, you don't hear people really cursing the name of Buddha. You don't dare uh, speak ill of the prophet Muhammad if you value your life. But boy, Jesus Christ, it's open season on him. Of course, the first time he came, the world crucified him. And those who don't accept him are still trying to treat him that way. The good news of the Bible is he doesn't come back as a sacrificial lamb and as a victim. He comes back as the mighty king of kings and lord of lords. This would be a good place for me to just uh, talk with you about our magazine at Prophecy in the News. Thank you for being a follower of us. We put out a monthly magazine. It's, it's been uh, in publication for over 20 years. And in the last two years, we have tried to uh, create articles that are full of biblical teaching combined with uh, new developments in culture, new developments in science, new developments in uh, discoveries of how biblical prophecy is being fulfilled now. We also have a feature every month from Bob Cornuk on biblical archaeology we are uh, very pleased with this product and we would offer it to you for subscription. And we, in the month of December that we just finished, had a uh, subscription drawing and I think we gave a free subscription away every day of the month. And that was very successful and getting in on that, we've had hundreds of new people subscribe. And uh, this month, if you care to go to our website or check our emails if you receive them, you can, or go to our Facebook page, uh, prophecyinthenews.com and Facebook there. Uh, you can uh, apply for a drawing to get a free digital subscription. And to those of you who follow Prophecy in the News and you're outside the continental United States or the, or the 50 states, you may uh, have an advantage, really, in taking a digital subscription. It's $10 less than the uh, hard edition, the, the, you know, the actually mailed copy, and there's no shipping handling for you at all, uh, no postage. So you can look into that, and we can see... The price is here on the screen and the arrangements that we have available for you. But we hope you follow us in that way. Let me come down to the verses in Daniel. I want to come to the one empire that I did not deal with, and that is the Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire will actually be in two parts. Uh, In the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, or excuse me, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, you know, Babylon was the head And then Persia, Medo-Persia, was the chest and arms. And again, there were two, as there are two arms, there were the Medes and the Persians that forged an empire. The Persians were the greater part of that. Then Greece represented actually the 
the stomach and the loins and, and that tells us that that's kind of the spring of life the wellspring of life and a lot of western civilization has Greco roman roots so we understand that but then rome is represented by the two legs and the ten toes and uh, when you look at that in daniel 2 and i'll i'll just read a little bit of the vision but as we look in chapter 2 uh the scripture says that as daniel is speaking to the king and giving him the interpretation verse 40 daniel 2 verse 40 it says the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron the kingdom shall be divided but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken we can make many applications from this but uh as time will permit number one there are obviously two legs um you could say that there was the western part of the roman empire classical rome italy headquartered later the byzantine empire which was after rome classically fell really constantinople byzantine became uh, headquarters for rome that lasted almost another thousand years after rome fell uh, that's one application but i see these uh, straddling centuries as well i see the rome of the day of the new testament but I'll see, also see the Rome that is mentioned and taught in prophecy as the revived Roman Empire that shall return. And uh, we'll talk more about details of that in just a moment. When we lay Daniel 7 besides this, we, we see this fourth beast, which is not really named. Persia was a bear, Babylon was a lion, Greece was a leopard. Rome is simply alluded to as a terrifying beast. Daniel 7, 7. After this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. Now without all the details here right now just keep in mind this beast has ten horns the dream of Nebuchadnezzar obviously there were ten toes. So uh, prophecy teachers have for years, you know, made a statement that they look for a revived Roman Empire that will be in the same Mediterranean basin area that is uh, Europe, northern and southern Europe on the west and then northern Africa cradled on the south. And uh, they look to that region and area and compare it. Uh, and, and ultimately, there was much thought when the uh, Treaty of Rome from the Club of Rome was done in the 1950s and the founding the beginnings of the of the European Union today we see the European Union in struggle and in tatters we see Brexit happening as Britain is stepped out by the vote of the people we see Frexit being talked about if you haven't heard of that yet that's the French some of them are saying let's pull out Italy voted for independence before it's all done Germany may rise and reassert itself so whether it's the EU or another manifestation uh, it's the spirit of Rome that we're going to look at and, and that rather than the geography. I do believe that we will see those old nations still arise. I have friends that are looking to other places for that final kingdom. I do believe that there's still uh, much reason to believe that out of Europe uh, these things will happen and uh, it's, it's close to the Middle East and accessible and it's just more of a, a sense of a connection to more continents of the world than the United States is which was isolated for so many years before it was even discovered by the West. So that aside, let's just think about the spirit of Rome. The spirit of Rome to me is almost indescribable uh, when you realize that it's, it's, uh, it's iron, it's ferocious and strong, it's destructive, and it's also uh, described as dreadful and terrible or terrifying, which is a good translation of what that word is in Hebrew, terrifying, creating a sense of terror. Uh, this is is really the dream and I, I want to relate this if I may uh, with you to our recent election and what God may have done I, I don't claim to know all the mind of God but there is an uptick in uh, encouragement today in our nation there's uh, at least among some people there's a little more hopefulness for religious liberty 
And I'm prepared, and I hope you are, if you're a follower of Jesus, to go wherever God takes us. And we can endure whatever he sends our way, and we can live and march through it. And, and Now, I believe in my heart that the church is going to be raptured out before the tribulation begins. But I'll tell you, look in the camera square, if we were called to go through uh, things even before then, or we were called to go through there, God would give us the grace to be true and to walk with him if we would if we would look to him for that strength and grace every day so let's remember our job is to abide in jesus our job is to be obedient our job is to be a witness for him that's what we do while we wait for him to return so whatever happens but let me step back and say this from the beginning of donald trump's uh pronouncements when he began to campaign when he began to lay things out i was listening and I don't know if he intended to do what he did because I think it's a lot smarter than his critics will give him credit for. I think he does know a lot of times what he's doing. But he really flushed out the phonies. And I was one who for years, you know, voted uh, for candidates that were pro-life, pro-marriage. They said all the right things. But even before the 2000s, uh, disappointed us again and again nobody went with rock ribbed solid convictions and a courage in their spine to do the hard things that need to be done to set our country back on a right path toward god and so when uh this last election unfolded i began to realize maybe with eyes like i'd never had that it's not a matter of conservative and liberal or a matter of Democrat and Republican and independents in the middle. It's really a matter of globalists and nationalists. And they call it populism. But the fact of the matter is God created the nations. And if you have a difficulty with that and believe we're all supposed to sing in harmony and have a Coca-Cola song, it's okay. But if Jesus invented it, it's going to happen. It's not going to be that way. Man will promise it, but he'll fail to deliver it. And when we look in the word of God in Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 9 as they come out of the flood and Noah's sons are told to disperse, we're given the table of the nations. That's a, a listing of 70 nations. God created nations. He puts people in certain uh, groups and boundaries and that's part of our identity. And you just can't ask people to ignore that and just have a global citizenship. And what I'm saying to you is this is what Rome tried to do. Rome beyond what greece did tried to enforce a universal culture a universal language a universal legal system and i say universal the chinese were out here doing their own thing and north america hadn't been discovered but in the known world as far as rome could see and go they were enforcing uniformity that was the world into which our lord was born and that is the world that will return when we turn to the end times in the book of Revelation. When you look in Revelation 13 and you see the beast again, not a statue, but a beast. God says, watch out for the beast. When the beast emerges out of the sea, the final world ruler, the Antichrist, as we know him. He's going to try to enforce a one world government. A one world religion, which is really just a, uh, a means to unify people. You can't unify people around policy. You can't unify people around politics. There's a few people that love that stuff, but the majority of people, they want to live their life. So you've got to touch their heartstrings. So even a crafty ruler knows we've got to have some kind of system of religion, the language of the heart. So there will be a one world religion, a one world government, and a one world economy. Now, I believe that in the uh, days leading up to this election, uh, I was prepared to give this study had the election gone in another direction, the other direction, and uh, I fear that we would have been greasing the skids to head toward globalism. Um, I happen to know, and many of you do as well from sources, uh, how entwined uh, the Clintons are with, uh, with globalists. George Soros, uh, a billionaire worth about twice what Donald Trump is, uh, has used his influence and his, uh, his means to try to create this world socialist government uh, he and other hidden unnamed faces uh, who maybe are a part of a hidden council that you and I only hear about in whispers 
but I, 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 I sense that God gave a reprieve and has used the most unlikely of instruments. And so whether you're watching this before or after the inauguration, we need to pray for our president and our vice president and our elected officials because I think God has given us a little breathing room not to relax, but to step up our vigilance, to pray that we might be able to share Christ, to live for Christ. And that's what all of this is about. It's not to scratch some itch we have about curiosity about end time. That's, that's okay, but as Jesus ascended, the angel said, ye men of Israel, why stand ye looking into heaven? Acts chapter 1. This same Jesus will uh, re return in the same manner as he left. Well, he left visibly. He left bodily. He left physically. He left accompanied by clouds and angels. He will return visibly. He will return bodily. He will return in a glorified eternal state. He will return with clouds and angels. And he will return as Jesus, the Son of God. He left from Mount uh, Olive, and he will return to the Mount of Olives, according to biblical prophecy, Acts 1, Zechariah 14. So these things we're sure of, but the angel said, don't stand around with your mouth open. Don't just gaze up into the sky. Go to Jerusalem, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, and then go and be his witnesses. And that's why we're here. That's why you're here. You know, if, if God just wanted to have you in his company, you get saved, he could rapture you right there. Wouldn't you see somebody come forward in the service and pray to receive Christ and poof, they're gone? The problem is if that happened, the church would be empty. There wouldn't have been a preacher preaching and so it couldn't have happened. So God leaves us here for a reason and it's that we might share our faith and the love of Christ. And that's what we want to encourage you to do as we stand in this new year. Uh, take the hope that we've been given. Take the gospel that's in our heart and share Jesus with everyone you know. And let me speak to those of you who may have joined us today and Christ is not real in your life. The Bible teaches that we are to really experience God. He's not a term or a concept. He's a loving father. He made you. He made you to know him. He made you that you might love him and walk with him and have obedience and that he might through your life do fantastic things. And what's needed is for you to make a surrender to him. If that's never happened in your life, we want to urge you today to call on the name of Christ. Ask Jesus to save you, forgive your sin, give you his eternal life, and you will become his child. It's a wonderful thing to know the Lord, and I wish that for all of us. Until then, let's keep looking up. Thank you.